Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, we'll just jump right into it. Of course, there in verse 1 where it says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep them and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Now, of course, we've already talked about the fact that Horeb is referring to Sinai. Um, and, you know, we've, we've dealt that with previous uh, sermons, so don't let that confuse you. But that's talking about when he came to Sinai out of, the, uh, out of Egypt and the pillar of fire came down, as we'll see here. He says in verse 3, The Lord made not his covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. So again, we were talking even previously, you know, this keeps coming up about how uh, God talked to them out of the midst of the fire and just that this, what an intense uh, meeting this was, what a unique time that this was. Uh, you know, did God ever do this before? Has God ever done this since? No, this is a very unique thing. And he, uh, he goes on in verse 5 and says, And I stood between the Lord at you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid by the reason of the fire and went not up into the mount, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And of course he goes on, this is one of the few, one of the couple places you find the Ten Commandments. You know, and we're all probably very familiar with that. And this is the Ten Commandments. Of course, the other place you can find those are over there in Exodus 20. So, you know, in a good way, a trick, you know, if you ever kind of wonder where are the Ten Commandments, I always think about the fact that, you know, Deuteronomy 5, 5 is half of 10. And then Exodus 20, 10 times 10 is 20. Or 10, yeah, 10 times 2, sorry. 10 times 10 is 100 and something. <laughs> Anyway, this isn't a good night for math. But y y you see how I kind of made an association there? So that always helped me. I don't know if that'll help you, but I thought I'd throw it out there. But he gets into the Ten Commandments here. Now, you know, it's just Ten Commandments. Of course, we know the Word of God has many other commandments. There's a lot of other things, but these are kind of the synopsis. This is kind of the overview. This is kind of the, the main points of uh, the law that God gives to the children of Israel. And, you know, he didn't give it, you know, in a memo. He didn't send an email or text them. I mean, he made... When he came down in a pillar of fire, that great sight that they beheld, it says that they were afraid of it. And, uh, you know, this is what he had to say. When God spoke face to face with a man, excuse me, yeah, face to face as with a man, as with a friend, when he spoke to them out of the midst of the fire, you know, he, of course they couldn't see God because he was in the fire. But when they heard his voice, this is what he said. You know, this is Moses recounting what was said. So when God comes down in a pillar of fire upon a mountain to speak to his people, you know, what he has to say is probably pretty important. You know, so this is, these are important things that we should understand. So he begins there and he says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Verse 7, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make, into thee any, uh, make thee any graven image or any likeness of the thing that is in heaven above or, upon, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. So God is, you know, right out of the gate saying he should have no other gods before me. You know, he used to be the Lord their God. That's the only God that they should serve. And then he moves right into the next commandment of, you know, thou shalt not make thee any graven image. You know, talking about idolatry. They should be making images and statues and things like that and worshiping them and, and bowing themselves down specifically what, is he sa what he says. And he says that they are not to make any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above. They are not to make any likeness of anything that is in the earth beneath or, things in, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Now, don't let that phrase confuse you. Waters beneath the earth. Because all that's referring to is the fact that, you know, obviously, obviously if you ever stood on the, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a beach, if you ever stood on the shore next to a body of water, the water is beneath the earth, yeah. you know. That's how, because we know that earth means dry land. That's why the Bible says in, in Genesis 1, verse 10, and God called the dry land earth. That's what he's referring to is the fact that the, the water is beneath the earth. It's not that there's, you know all of our continents are drifting around like lily pads, you know, and there's a bunch of water underneath of them. So that, don't let that throw you off there. Now, what I kind of want to focus in on here is the fact, you know, the, the Catholic Church, you know, they, they start, this is where we start to get some serious differences because here's the thing, the Catholic Church, they make graven images. Yeah. You know, there's no denying that. Anyone who's been in a Catholic Church, there's statues everywhere of saints and Mary and Jesus, where, where, where they suppose he looked like. You know, Je Jesus in all stages of life, as a baby, you know, every Catholic church has, you know, uh, Jesus hanging on the cross somewhere, usually at some point. So they have a lot of imagery, you know, and they, and they're sensitive about this. They don't, they don't like to talk about this and they, they, so you say, well, how do they get around this? Well, what they do is they just kind of combine the first two commandments. They just say, thou shalt have no other Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other God besides me. You know, I am the Lord thy God. 
which brought the land of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, that's the first commandment. And then they'll just take the second one, which is thou shalt not make thee any graven image. That's the second commandment. And they'll just make it the same thing. And they'll just say, you know, well, that's okay to do that because, you know, God just doesn't want us to worship, you know, uh, you know heathen gods, you know. So they'll combine those two. And then, of course, at the end, you have to have ten commandments. So they divide up the last commandment about covetousness. And we'll get to that in a minute. But they'll argue that, you know, that it's okay for them to do this because it's a religious use of statues. That's what they say. This is, God never, con you know, condemned the religious use of statues. You know, they'll say, back then they didn't know who God was or they didn't know what God looked like, but then Jesus came and, and now we can make these statues of Mary and everybody else because these aren't, these aren't pagan, heathen gods. And, but here's the thing. God said very clearly that thou shalt not make thee any graven image. Yeah. Period. You know, that's, that's what he said. And then they'll kind of argue, they'll try to cite some other passages where, where it might, you might think, oh, where God has somebody make a graven image, like in the Ark, or, or excuse me, oh, in the Ark of the Covenant. They argue, you know, they'll say, well, God used religious engravings when he made the Ark of the Covenant. And he had the two cherubims, remember that? The rings, their wings were outstretched. But here's the thing, it's true that God did that, but you don't ever, you never see them bowing down to that. You know, and, and, and the reason why God did that is because all of those things, the ark, the tabernacle, all of that, were a direct reflection of what is actually in heaven. Now, God couldn't send physical, actual cherubims like are up in heaven to stand over the ark of the covenant like, like are there. But So he had to make these things to represent what is in heaven. And you find that in Hebrews 8. And for sake of time, we've got a lot to get through. I'm not going to turn us there. But Hebrews 8 very tells us very clearly that... Uh, <coughs> That, he, uh, that God, uh, uh, Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou maketh, make uh, all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. And that these things were a shadow of the heavenly, uh, the heavenly things. So that's why God used that. Now, you can't just take that one instance and run with it. And say, oh, well, God let him make cherry bims. Yeah, but that's, like, that's one instance where God allowed that. And it was for a very specific reason. And then just turn that into, okay, well, now we're going to have this multitude of graven images that we're going to bow down to. And here's the thing. You never, see God, you never see God's people bowing down to these statues. You never see them bowing down to the cherubims. You never see them worshiping the cherubims. They're always worshiping the Lord God. And you do see, you do see Catholics bowing down to, to these images all the time. They admit that. And, you know, ver verse 9 is very clear. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them. He said, look, you're not going to make a graven image and don't bow down to it. I mean, could it be clear, clear? Nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So, again, why is God so adamant about this? Because he's a jealous God. We talked about that, you know, Sunday night when we went through Deuteronomy 4. You know, God doesn't like man creating an image and saying, this is God, and venerating it, whatever you want to call it, worshiping it, bowing down to it. And when God's up in heaven, you know, getting the cold shoulder. And God very clearly says, thou shalt not bow down thyself. Now, again, the Catholic Church, they don't like this. You know, they, don't, they, they get very touchy about this. And in fact, they've got a lot of counter arguments that they try to pull out. And if you go to Catholic.com, you know, you can, you can find some articles like I did where it's, you know, this one question says, well, what about bowing? So this is how the Catholics will explain it. They'll say, uh, some anti-Catholics, you know, cite Deuteronomy 5, 9, where God said, concerning idols, you shall not bow down to them. Since many Catholics sometimes bow or kneel in front of statues. Now stop with, right there. The guy just admitted on the article at Catholic.com that Catholics bow down to him, right? Okay, so he's saying, look, it's true. Yeah, we bow down to him, all right? Now watch him change the goalpost. He'll move the goalpost and say, you know, because what's the commandment? Thou shalt not bow down to them, right? But we bow down to them. Okay, well, you're guilty right there. You've broken the commandment. But they try to move the goalpost by saying, uh, they'll, they'll say, uh, <coughs> they, they say that, that, that uh, because they bow down or sometimes bow or kneel in front of statues of Jesus and the saints, anti-Catholics confuse the legitimate veneration of a sacred image with the sin of idolatry. And they'll say, though bowing can be used to, uh, uh, as a posture in worship, not all bowing is worship. Yeah, but that's not the point. That God didn't say don't worship them. He does say that elsewhere, to not worship them. But here, when he gives the commandments, he says don't bow down. 
whether you're doing it because you're worshiping them, whether you're doing it because you're venerating them, a word that's not found in the Bible, whether you're doing it because you just have respect, or as they try to explain it, which I found humorous here, uh, that it's just, it's, it's, it's like giving a handshake. That's, that's what they say. In Japan, people show respect by bowing and greeting, the equivalent of the Western handshake. So that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, it's kind of a silly uh, argument. To say, well, we can't, obviously, we can't shake this idol's hand. You know, we can't say, hey, Mother Mary, how are you doing today? So we're just going to bow, you know, and just show a sign of respect. Friend, they're bowing down to these things. Yeah. And that's, whether they're doing it, for whatever reason they're doing it, the Bible's very clear here. And I've looked it up in their own Bibles. This is in their Bible that they use. It says, thou shalt not, and it's a word a little different, but it's the same thing. Thou shalt not bow down thyself. <coughs> so they'll say, you know, Look, we're just, you know, we're just bowing to it, but that doesn't mean we're worshiping it. You know, we're just venerating it. But the thing is, the Bible is very clear. This is not to bow down to it. And, you know, here's the thing. You think, well, you're being, you know, and here's the thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mad at, at Catholics. I don't hate Catholics. I hate the Catholic Church. Okay, I hate Catholic doctrine because it's leading people to hell. Because they teach a false gospel. They teach a false salvation. And I want to I want to rescue people out of Catholicism. Yeah. That's why we go to you know these neighborhoods, and, and when we we, we, run, we knock the doors of Catholics and try to give them the gospel of, of salvation by grace through faith, and try to pull them out of that because they're you know they're good intention, they're good people often, but you know what they're they're unsaved, yeah. and if they die believing what the Catholic Church teaches them, they're going to wake up in hell, and you know I have more of a burden for them. Then, then you know, we have as a church we have more of a burden for them um, than you know, most people. You know, we love them; we want them to be saved. But you know, I'm not gonna. It's not gonna stop me from pointing out the the, the fallacy in the Catholic Church to, to to point out the error in the Catholic Church and to point out the wickedness in the leadership in the Catholic Church. You know, and they 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 could say they don't bow down to it that they they don't worship these images. Well, then how do you explain this? How do you explain a, a man in a dress who calls himself father, yeah. you know, the Pope, you know, who where God, when Jesus very clearly said, call no man upon the earth father, you know, there's another one, kissing these statues. This is a little bit more than just bowing. Yeah. I mean, here he is smooching these things. He's laying a big wet one on them, right? I mean, you look at, the, I mean, he's got the baby here. He's kissing the baby. You think, well, that's the same picture. No, same baby, different hat. You know, he's got the Dagon fish hat on this one. You know, here's one kissing some bloody Christ picture. You know what I never understood is why they always want to keep Jesus on the cross. You know, my Savior isn't on the cross. My Savior came down off the cross, was buried, died, and rose again. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now, I don't know why they want to keep bringing up this image in their mind of Christ on the cross. It's like, they, it's, it's like Satan likes just pointing out the fact that Jesus died. So, you know, how do you explain this then? You know, if they, well, we're just, we're just venerating it. I'd say so. I mean, I'd say you've, you're really venerating there. You know, and this is just the pictures of the Pope that I, I felt appropriate to show. I'm not showing you the ones where he's kissing another man on the mouth. I'm not saying like, you know, in some, in some cultures where they just kind of do the, you know, the little thing on the cheek, whatever. We don't do that here, you know. You know, we, we don't bow like in Japan either. <laughs> we shake hands, get some docks every now and then, you know, like tonight when you have, when you've been blowing your nose, do the docks. You know, but we don't kiss on the cheek, and we certainly don't kiss another man on the mouth. But this guy does, okay? And I've got pictures. To, you just go look Catholic, or go look up uh, Pope kissing statues, and you'll find it. Kissing imams on the mouth. It's weird, man. So you can sit there and say, you know, well, we don't, we don't worship them. Well, I mean, what do you call this? Then? <laughs> you know, well, it's veneration. Yeah, I mean... It's, it's, it's a little extreme, you know, and uh, again, I'm not trying to, you know, just pick on Catholics and just mock everything, but this is a wicked man, Amen. you know, teaching false doctrine to trilli a trillion people, True. or a trillion, a billion people. My math is way off tonight. <laughs> a billion, you know, one-seventh of the Earth's population identify as Catholic. You know, that's a billion people. And it's a false gospel. And, you know, we could go into all of that about the Catholic Church. And those are whole sermons that could be preached. But I just want to take the time to point out the fact that, you know, they, they violate this commandment. Call it whatever you want. Call it venerating, worship, uh, deep respect, whatever. You're bowing down to it. You've broken the commandment. You know, if you, if you trip and fall over it and, and do this, you know, that, 
I mean, you're this close to bowing, you know. Watch it. Make sure your shoes are tied when you walk around those things. God said not to bow down to them. He doesn't make any mention of worshiping in the context of these commandments. And look, man, common sense just tells us this is worship. This is bowing down to an idol. That's what this is. <clears throat> Let's move on, though. Verse 10. And he goes on and says, you know, he, he visits the iniquity in verse 9 of the first, uh, under the first and fourth generation and showing mercy in the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You know, there's still good news for the Catholic and every other false religion out there that God is still willing to show mercy and save them. And he goes on in verse 11, and it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So the next commandment, you know, not to take the name of the Lord of God in vain. Now, what does that mean? It's when you're just kind of using God's name flippantly. You know, when you're using God's name like a cuss word. When you're using God's name to express your personal disgust for something. You know, like I heard today at church when they had the contractor come, the carpet installer showed up and they're, you know, they're, they're just throwing God's name around in a church. You know, and, and it's, it's wrong. It's wicked. And uh, <coughs> here's the thing. You know, it, I, I, it's always interesting that that's what people use to express their personal disdain for something. You know, they, they, use, they use the Lord's name like that. You know, why don't they use Buddha? Why don't they use Muhammad? You know, it, it's wicked. And God says don't do it. You can see why, why God's making these, these Ten Commandments. Why God took the time when He came down to Pillar of Fire to bring up these specific commandments. He goes, you got this, you got people saying it, say, taking His name in vain. You know, it seems like these are common things among men. So he says, not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, you know, just as, you know, on this point, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, if you hear somebody do that, you got to rebuke them sharply. You know, and, and I agree with that to an extent. I think you kind of have to feel those people out. Because I've done that and have people like, oh, you don't like that? And then they just pour it on more. So you got to figure out who it is you're dealing with before you go, you know, because then you're going to hear it all the time. You know, and you're not their dad. You can't make them stop. They're just going to do whatever they want. So, but I think it's appropriate, you know, if when we hear somebody do that to at least, you know, you know, again, depending on the type of people you're, that you're dealing with, maybe say, hey, I'd appreciate it if you don't do that. You know, I had, I remember one time I had a guy at work and he was, he was doing it, but I could tell he knew I was Christian. He knew I was, you know, I believed in the Bible and all that. And he, and he would take the Lord's name in vain. You know, but he, I could tell he's just doing it out of habit. You know, it wasn't like trying to, you know, get one in on me or something like that. Because some guys will do that. If they find out you don't like that kind of thing, they just lay it on thicker. You know, that's why you should never, you know, complain about having your feelings hurt to, to a group of guys or something. Because they'll just, they'll just pile on. It's like, you know, it's like blood in the water, you know, and the sharks come. So, but he, this guy, you know, he had said it. And, and one day I just, I, it was bothering me. I was like, man, I got to say something. I got to, I want this to stop. You know, I could tell he's just doing it. He kind of, you know, subconsciously, he's not really thinking about what he's saying. So he said it one day, and he was standing right next to me. He said it. He said, you know, Jesus Christ. And I said, I said, praise his holy name. That's how I, that's how I kind of rebuked him. He kind of looked at me. And then he did it again later. I said, praise his holy name. Bless him. You know, I knew another guy, whenever he had guys do that work, that he'd say, oh, you know my Savior too? You know him? Oh, great. And he'd, want, he'd try to get him saved and stuff like that. So... You know, because that happens a lot. People, you'll hear it all the time. Yeah. You know, and, and even, as, you know, just because you got saved doesn't mean you're going to stop doing that. You know, you might not say Jesus Christ, but we might say, you know, God, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, we stub our toe or we, you know, get hurt. We inflict physical pain upon ourselves. And, you know, that's when you really find out what's in the heart of man. You know, when you, when you, when you hurt yourself severely, what comes out of your mouth. <laughs> you know, that's when the abundance of the heart really begins to speak. Right. You know, when you're in traffic and, 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 you, and you, you know, you're road raging or whatever. <laughs> like, I know this one guy, uh, he worked at UPS early in the morning and he, uh, he was, a, he was an, a loader, an un unloader loader. So all the boxes are coming off, all the packages, and you have to sort them on the belt and get them down there. And he had this, like, incredible, it was an over 70 pounds. Anytime he got 70 pounds or more, he had to get two guys to move the box. And, and that was the policy, but a lot of guys would just grab it, you know, and just because it was all about get it done. And he grabs the 70-pound box, and some of those little boxes can be really heavy. You don't know what's in them. 
and he drops it on his toe and he's just wearing sneakers. He's not wearing steel toes. And it literally like, I don't want to get too graphic, but it like just burst his big toe. Like, it would, like he took his sock off later and just like, it was just like hamburger. But he was so proud of himself because he was kind of a new Christian. And he came to, he was, he was sharing the story at a men's prayer, you know, Monday night men's prayer meeting we were at. And he's like, man, I dropped this thing on my toe today and praise God, I, I just said, ouch. You know, I didn't, I didn't blaspheme. I didn't, I didn't say cuss words. He just went, ow. And he said, and I, I, you know, I went back to work and I took care of it later. You know, he's really proud of himself. But, you know, I don't know how, why I'm going off on that. But, you know, but that is kind of what people do, isn't it? They get hurt. You know, they hit their thumb with a hammer. And the next thing you know, the Lord's name's coming out. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't take the Lord's name and exp express our disgust for something. You know, it's not what his name is there for. His name is holy. You know, his name is to, be, is to be exalted on high. His name is to be lifted up in praise. You know, and, you know, it's interesting because Pastor Anderson was preaching on Exodus chapter 20 last night. So I kind of got some, some uh, like a pre, like some prep for this sermon. Uh, I just worked out that way because he's going through the Ten Commandments too. And he said, and I, this is really good rule of thumb, you know, it, to figure out whether or not you're using the Lord's name correctly. You know, and here's what you have to ask yourself. Two questions to figure out whether or not you're using the names of the Lord correctly. You can ask yourself these two questions. Are you talking to God or are you talking about God? And if you're talking to God or about God, you know, you're probably not blaspheming God. You're using his name in the proper context. Anything outside of that, you might want to check out what's going on, you know, because you're probably, probably not. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and just keep moving through here. And he says in verse 12, uh, you know, and ke uh, keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord hath God hath commanded thee. Six days sh thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it thou shalt do, uh, not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy mans the manser men servant, a manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy uh, manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. So he's saying, look, everybody's going to get the day off, and you're going you're gonna to do this. And why? Because God labored six days, and he took a rest. Now, this, there are a lot of things that, that we still observe in the law. This is not one of them. This has been done away in Christ. And, you know, a lot of people will get hung up on this. You know, I, th I believe it's the Seventh-day Adventists yeah. that are all about the Sabbath. You know, and, and, the, and the Sabbath, they worship on Saturday. That's their day off. And, uh, you know, we do not observe the Sabbath any longer. This has been done away in Christ. Because here's the thing. There are spe specific commandments that God has specifically repealed in the New Testament. And if you would, go to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to look at a few verses. Now, a lot of things, you know, God doesn't have to be redundant. I mean, isn't the Old Testament pretty long? Yeah. Old Testament's got a lot of, a lot of, you know, stories, but it's also got a lot of, you know, chronologies, and it's also got a lot of, of the commandments. And God laid down the law. Does God need to repeat all that in the New Testament to remind us what has and what hasn't been done away in Christ? No, He doesn't. And, and the things that are, 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 are no longer to be observed in the New Testament are specifically addressed in the New Testament. He says, look, these things are done away. He says in Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that which was against us, which was contrary to you, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities, he made a show of them, hopefully, trying them in it. Let no man, okay, verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in spective and holy day. That would be a Sabbath. That's a holy day. Or any of the feast days, the Passover, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of the Ingathering, all these things, or the new moon. You know, you've got, we don't observe new moons anymore. Or of the Sabbath days. Okay, so he specifically says, don't let any man judge you in this. So, so do we observe this commandment in the New Testament that we are to keep the Sabbath day? No. But, wh but why is that? Because it's specifically repealed. Now, does God have to reiterate the fact that we shouldn't take his, his name in vain no. for us to, to observe that, that, that rule? Or many, any of the other laws that are outside of the Ten Commandments? Does God have to remind us that, you know, we shouldn't be looking on the nakedness of our in-law or, of, or of, our, of our relatives or in-laws or anything like that? No. God addresses all that. 
In Leviticus, it says, thou shalt not look on the nakedness of, you know, your, your aunt, your uncle, your niece, your nephew, your sister, your brother. You know, it just goes on and on. All these people whose nakedness you're not to uncover, which is a euphemism. And uh, so does God have to reiterate all that in the New Testament to remind us not to do that? No. The things that God has repealed in the New Testament are specifically addressed in the New Testament. So if it's not brought up, we still observe it. And the Sabbath here, he's specifically saying, look, don't let any man judge you in this. These things are done away in Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. You say, well, you know, why, why is God changing the law? You know, why, why are some things changed? But the things are, there are things that are changed. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So he's saying right here, look, the priesthood changed. It used to be the Levitical priesthood. Now we're under the, uh, you know, the, the priesthood of Christ, you know, the, Melchizedek, the priesthood of Melchizedek, excuse me. And that because there's a change of this priesthood, there is a change also of the law. It's not that the law is done away completely, that there aren't things that we observe in the law that are still applicable today. It's just that some things have been changed. There is a change in law. And what are those changes? It's the Sabbaths, it's the holy, it's the it's the new moons, it's the holy days, you know, it's the the, the dietary restrictions have been lifted, you know, in Acts where Peter is up on the roof and he see, has the vision of the blanket come down, and God says, Rise and eat, and there's all the manner of beasts in it, and that and that quilt, that blanket that comes down, and he says, Not so, Lord, no for nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. You know, he says, I've never eaten unclean beast. And God rebukes him and says, What God hath have cleansed called on thou not unclean. So God's repealing that. Of course, because here's the thing, all of these things were, were symbolic. All these things, they, there was no magical thing about the Sabbath day. There was no magical thing about not eating shellfish. All these things were, 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 uh, to, sh were to be uh, uh, you know, used as symbolism to picture Christ. You know, the Sabbath is a picture of the rest that we have in Christ. You know, Christ has come. He is our Sabbath. You know, he is our rest. So that the Sabbath is done away. We no longer look to Christ in that sense. We, we, ha we have that knowledge. So, so here's the thing. It says there that there was a change also of the law. So you can't argue that, that some things have changed in the law, right? So if the Sabbath and the sacrifices are not changed, what did change? That's what I would ask these people. Well, we still observe the Sabbath. Okay, well then what did change? Uh, 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 you know, is it okay to... <laughs> to go look on, you know, your auntie's nakedness now all of a sudden? No. You know, is it okay to go ahead and marry your sister? No. Well, what changed then? Well, it says right there what changed. You know, we read it. It's a change of these, the Sabbath days, the meat, the drink, the respective holidays, the new moons and all that. So, you know, again, I know I'm kind of just going over these things and just kind of touching on them. And really, these, these could deserve whole sermons. I preached about the Sabbath, uh, I think, a few months ago. And uh, <coughs> we could talk more about that another time. But let's move along here. Uh, commandment number 5, verse 16. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. <coughs> Does God need to reiterate that again <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament? No. But you know what? He does. He does, he does it reiterate, he does remind us of that. That they days may be prolonged, that it may be well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So it says that we are to honor our father and thy mother. That's what he, he says there. Now how do you do that? How do you honor your father and your mother? I should have had you stay there uh, in the New Testament, but in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. You know, every kid, every kid in this room, they all know this verse, right? This is every, every child in this room, this is your life verse, right? You've got this memorized. This is, you, you wake up in the morning, just this is the first thing that enters your mind. It should, because it's addressed to you. You know, why do we keep the kids in the church? Well, because the Bible addresses them. I mean, isn't it interesting that Ephesians, a book to, to, to the, the people at Ephesus, specifically addresses children? Look there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children. It doesn't say parents. It doesn't say parents. Go, you know, after junior church, remind your kids... You know, he's, no, this epistle was being read in the church. And he's addressing children in the church, in the church service. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I mean, isn't that a great thing, kids, that the Bible is written to you? That God has specifically addressed kids. You might not like what he has to say, right? But isn't it great that God is addressing you? 
He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Look at verse 2. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, it's interesting he says that there. He says that this commandment, this fifth commandment, is the first commandment with promise. Meaning that there's a promise attached with it. That if you'll observe this, there's something you benefit from it. That it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. You know, obeying your parents, kids, is important. God puts a premium on it. And God promises that if you obey your parents, that it'll be well with thee, and that you will live long on the earth. Now, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to live a long life on the earth? I know I do. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, feeling like it's half over already. <laughs> you know, I'm like, man, I want, to get, I want to get as much out of this latter half as I can get. Yeah. You know, so we should honor our parents, you know. And that's a, that's a promise that's made, made to us, that if we'll honor our parents, that God is going to bless us for that. And how do you do that? You obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You know, when mom and dad say to do something, you do it. You know, you don't back talk. You don't give excuses. You just do what you're told. That's how you obey. Well, you know, obedience is not, is not, where you, is not a, a two-way conversation where you're told to do something and then, you're, and then you bring up an objection. You know, obedience is you're told to do something and you do it. That's what it means to obey. <coughs> so, again, all, of the, all these topics we're talking about tonight, every one of these could just be entire sermons. But that's a great one there. That's, and that's not just, you know, well, why does God want to, you know, me to obey my parents so that it'd be well with thee? Because here's the thing. Your parents, you know, if they're godly parents, they have your best interests in mind. Right. They've already been down that road that you're approaching. They've already lived life longer than you. They already know the pitfalls and the snares of life. And they want to teach you, and they want to give you character, and they want you to... You know, grow up in the nurture and the mission of the Lord so you can avoid these mistakes, so you can avoid these pitfalls. You know, they have your best interest in mind. That's why you got to obey your parents. Now, go back to Exodus, or excuse me, Deuteronomy, where we were. He says in Deuteronomy, uh, you know, uh, we'll get into verse 17. You know, the shortest of the commandments. Thou shalt not kill. You know, thou shalt not kill. Now, if you would, keep something there, but go over to Matthew chapter 19, because we need to clarify this. Especially in this day and age, you know. In a day and age where people will try to, there will be people that will turn this verse and say, well, you know, right there, that means we should never put anybody to death. You know, they're anti-capital punishment. But hang on. The Bible prescribes the death penalty. The Bible specifically says in certain instances that you are to put somebody to death. There's only, there's only three punishments in the Bible. In crimi the criminal law is, you know, the criminal justice system in the Bible is pay a, pay a fine, take a beating, or die. Those are the three things that God prescribes. You won't find jail, you won't find prison, you won't find probation, you won't find all these other man-made things. There's just these three things. And it's better because it lets people get over it, pay their due, and move on with their life. You know, unless, of course, you know, <laughs> they get the death penalty. It's kind of hard to move on with your life after that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, people will turn us and say, well, see, we shouldn't have the death penalty because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. But is that what the Bible means here? Because that would be a huge contradiction. I mean, we all know Leviticus 20.13, you know. They are worthy of, you know, that they, their blood shall be upon them, you know. So it says in Matthew 19, look at verse 16, Jesus clarifies what this means. He gives it more specifically. He says in verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto them, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. So you read it in Deuteronomy as thou shalt not kill, but when Jesus, the Lord, cites it, when he quotes it in the New Testament, he calls it murder. So that's what the Bible means here. It doesn't mean you should not... You, you should never kill anybody because there are instances where people are to be killed. I mean, talking about you should not murder somebody. You, know, you should not exact vengeance on someone uh, just because you have a grudge or you shouldn't, you know, you covet something. That kind of stuff happens all the time. You know, you shouldn't go uh, hire a hitman to take out your spouse. That would be murder. That's what it's talking about here. That kind of stuff happens. You know, you shouldn't kill people just to get what you want. So it's the, it, it, this isn't talking about anti, being anti-capital punishment. This isn't even talking about being anti-war, you know. 
And I'm not for the wars, you know, the vast majority of the wars, probably all of them by and large, that we are involved with. You know, they're not, they're not over there fighting for our freedoms because, you know, and, that, and I don't want to get political, it's a whole other thing. But they're, they're fighting to build an empire, you know, and, and resources. You know, they lust and desire and have not. They lust and, and desire and they kill and have not. But, uh, <coughs> you know, this isn't an anti-war slogan. You know, there are times when a nation should defend itself. Or we as individuals should defend ourselves. That we should, you know, defend ourselves physically and kill the other individual if need, if so. If a guy's coming to kill me, it's going to be me or him. It's, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure it's him. You know, and that's not murder. That's me defending myself. That's a nation defending itself. And, and by the way, this is not pro-vegan either. You know, we got to clarify that today. Because that, that is just going, getting out of control. I'm getting updates of, or, or notifications on my phone from my Chipotle app now. Or Chipotle. i got to train myself. I always say it wrong. Chipotle. Because, you know, they're like, hey, come get bonus points today. Go meatless at Chipotle. Like, the first section, there's like a whole section of your, of your, of your bar there that is nothing but meat. You know, why would I go there and not eat meat? You know, so they're promoting this. Even, even them are trying to promote this vegan lifestyle. And this has taken off in this country and around the world. This pro-vegan, don't kill it. If it has a face, don't eat it. You know, even the fish. You know, just because you can't hear him scream doesn't mean it's not murder. It's out there, folks. People are going bananas. And you can't, but you can't turn to this verse and say that's what that means because Jesus said it's talking about murder. Okay, and killing a cow and putting it between two buns and eating it is not murder. All right, that's called common sense and, and good practice. So I'm glad we took the time to clarify, "Thou shalt not kill." Hopefully, you know, I, you guys can go. The kids can go back to stomping on bugs and everything like that, and uh, so on and so forth. And then he goes on in verse 18. The next he goes and, and the next command we get there. So we get just several of them here, just back to back in these verses. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, I'm, I'm sure everybody, for the most part, in the room knows what that is. You know, you shouldn't go and cheat on your spouse you know you shouldn't and uh you know violate the the bonds of, of matrimony you know you should you shouldn't go uh, uh sleeping around with other people's spouses which by the way you know speaking of death penalty is something that god condemned with death penalty uh that's another sermon for another time he goes on neither shalt thou steal yeah, i think we all know what that is right if you don't just come see me after the service i'll take something that's yours to illustrate that, well, that's, a, that's what it is. Hold out your wallet. This is called stealing. You know, government does it every paycheck. Um, I said I wasn't going to get political. Verse 20, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now this one you got to kind of clear up because a lot of people say, you know, we'll use this to say, well, that means you shouldn't lie. I mean, yeah, it, it, because bearing false witness is lying. But, you know, there are instances in the, in, in, in the uh, in, even in the Bible where you see people lying and God blessing him for it. You think of the, uh, the, uh, the midwives in Egypt where Pharaoh said, you know, kill, kill all the firstborn. And they said, oh, you know, and he rebukes the midwives for not doing it. They say, well, the, the, the Hebrew uh, women are lively. And they've, you know, they've given birth before we can, there's, it's too late by the time you get there. That wasn't true. And, God, and the Bible says that God gave them houses of their own, meaning he also gave them families for, for standing up. You know, for it was right for they were they lied to preserve life, right? And you know, you think of like uh, Rahab the harlot. You know, she hid the spies when they came over to, to and spied out Jericho, and she told them, "Oh, they took off already. You need to go find them." God, you know, God blessed her. She spared her family. You know, so what this is talking about is is more of a, you know. You shouldn't bear false witness in the sense that you should not bring an accusation against somebody that is untrue. You know, you cannot, you cannot condemn, uh, but here's the thing. You can't, also, you cannot use this to condemn those that are making judgments based on the facts that they're presented with. Okay? So if someone gives you, if, if somebody makes a judgment based on the facts that are presented to them, wh whether it's from a false witness or a true witness, you cannot condemn that person making that judgment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I read, I, you know, Pastor did a really good job clarifying this last night. If you, you know, and by the way, I've been meaning to say this. If you're listening to any other preaching outside of what's going on here, you should be listening to Pastor Anderson because he is your pastor. And if you listen to the sermon he preached last night, he goes into depth on this and was a really good point. And then I read this today in my devotions 
And I'd like to take a look at it because I thought this was a perfect example of what he was talking about last night. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 1. 2 Samuel chapter 1. If I'm a judge, if I'm a judge and I'm here to pass judgment on somebody in a criminal court, and the witness, let's say there's a guy over here, he's accused of murder, and they, we have these witnesses, and they're saying, oh yeah, it was him. You know, I saw a guy who was driving the same car that, that, that you're saying the murderer had. His car was on the scene, same make, same model. I saw it. You know, he was fleeing the scene. He was there. And that guy that's saying that is lying. That's a false witness. That's what it's talking about. You know, somebody saying, oh yeah, I saw him. Didn't see him. Just lying, bold face lying. That's the false witness. Okay? Now, if I as a judge, I have no way of knowing whether or not this guy's telling the truth or not. Okay? If he's found out to be a false witness, then the Bible teaches that he should receive the punishment that was intended for the one accused. So if this guy's over here facing the death penalty, and it's found out this false witness is bringing, you know, uh, a, wit a false witness against him, and it's found out, then this guy gets the death penalty, and this guy goes free. But that doesn't always happen. Not every time am I going to know whether or not this guy, as the judge, the f this witness is telling the truth or not. But if I take all the facts that are presented and I make a judgment based on the facts presented to me, that does not, and I'm wrong, and I, can, I say, well, you know, based on all the testimony that we received, you know, I find you guilty of X, Y, and Z. But, and, and, and the guy's not guilty, that doesn't make me a false witness as the judge. Because all I'm doing is I'm using the facts that are presented to me. And this is important because, you know, people will make judgments and say things about people and say, hey, based on the evidence that I see about this individual, the things that they said, the things that they do, the way they look, the way they're acting, they are this or that or the other thing. And then people say, well, you're a fault. That's not true. You're a false witness. You know, you're bringing a railing accusation. No, I'm taking the information that's presented to me and making a judgment. The only person that can be the false witness is the guy that comes and knowingly lies and says, yeah, I saw him. And just a bold faced lie. That's the false witness. For second Samuel, let's take the time to read it because this is a great example of it. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1. This is after, of course, in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Malachites and David abode two days in Ziklag. It came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. So it was uh, when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David, David said unto him, How went the matter, I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, The people are fled from the battle, and many of the people are also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man uh, that told him, how, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man told him, uh, 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 that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Geboa, Behold, Saul leaned upon a spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when we looked behind me, he saw me, and he called unto me, and I answered, and, and, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me, uh, uh, Again, stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet was on his arm, and have brought them hither to my Lord. Now, is that how Saul died? No. no. If you read the previous, you know, the last chapter of the previous book, a few pages behind your Bible, the Bible teaches us very clearly that Saul Paul, fell upon his own sword. He asked his armor bearer, he said, slay me, you know, lest they come and, and, and uh, invite, you know, they were gonna, he was afraid the Philistines were going to come and desecrate his body, which they did. <coughs> and, uh, but the, the armor bearer wouldn't do it. So as he says, he fell on his own sword. It doesn't mean he was running with scissors and tripped. It means he, he put the sword down and laid himself on it. Gruesome death. And his armor bearer did likewise when he saw that Saul was dead. So this guy's lying, right? Yeah. This guy's a false witness. He's saying, this is what happened. This is how it all played out. Let me tell you all about how it played out. And what, it, what happens to this guy? Of course, we understand his motive. He's trying to get something from David because he, he knows that David and Saul are you know enemies although David is you know hasn't hasn't done anything against Saul even though he could or had opportunity to so he's trying to get reward from David because he knows they've been enemies in the past saying hey if I go tell David that I killed Saul you know he'll probably 
you know, give me something. Say, oh, good job, you know, and give me a reward. So he breaks up this story about how he found Saul, you know, and, and he's the one that killed him. It's a false witness, right? So what does David do? <clears throat> then David took hold of his clothes, verse 11, and rent them. And likewise, all the men that were th were with them, and they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. Now, if I were this Amalekite that just brought this story, I'd be getting nervous right about now. Because that's not the reaction I was hoping for. Hey, I killed your enemy. <laughs> Fasting, ashes, mourning. Like, uh-oh. You know, he did, so, you know, David didn't roll out the cake and ice cream and put on the party hats and start popping confetti. Yeah, Saul's dead. Have a good time. This bothered him, you know. And, and <coughs> anyway, I don't want to go off on that because that, I mean, that the, the way David was towards Saul is, is, is uh, very interesting. A very compassionate, very long-suffering. But, um, but this isn't the, uh, the, re the reaction the guy was expecting. <laughs> Verse 13. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? He answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said unto him, How was thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Uh-oh. <laughs> and David called for one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And, and he smote him that he died. And the David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. So does that make David a false accuser? Does that make him a false witness? I mean, did this guy do it? No, he didn't do it. But a false witness came and gave, you know, this is why you should not bear false witness. Because one, you'll condemn the guiltless, and two, it could come back on your own head. So this is a perfect example. I mean, David was right to do this. The Bible does not condemn David for having done this anywhere. You won't find it where he said, well, you know, David was a little harsh in Malachite. And, it was, and David took the, took the evidence that was presented to him and passed judgment upon the man. And the Bible doesn't condemn him for it. So, you know, that's a good example. I thought that was a great example of someone being a false witness. And how if we pass judgment based on someone's testimony, what they say, if we just go with the facts that are presented us, that can, does not make us a false witness, even if it's a bad testimony, if it's a false testimony that's given to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'll move on. Because <coughs> it's, it's getting there. So he says in uh, verse, go back to verse 21. So we've been covering the Ten Commandments tonight. Honor, you know, your, your father and mother. Uh, thou shalt not kill, you know. Uh, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. <coughs> Verse 21. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, in his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. So this is the commandment that, because remember earlier, the, we talked about how the fact the Catholic Church, they take the first two commandments and put them together. Well, if you do that, now you only got nine commandments. And everyone knows it's ten commandments, right? So now you got to, well, where are we going to make up this other commandment? Well, this is where they make it up. Because they'll say, you know, not, thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's wife. That's one commandment. And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's stuff. So they separate the wife and the possessions of your neighbors and say, well, that's two commandments there. So that's where they make up the other one. But, you know, the Bible just, you know, and elsewhere it quotes it as thou shalt not covet. You know, it, just won't, it, doesn't, it doesn't make that. Uh, clarification between a wife and possessions. So, uh, you know, for whatever that's worth, that's where they make it up. Verse 22, And the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount of the midst of the fire, of the cloud and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. You know, this, this is another statement that keeps coming up. You know, you shall, not add aught, you shall not add to it, neither shalt thou diminish aught from it. You know, God's given you enough to work on right there. You know, you, th those Ten Commandments, you know, if you know, just work on that, and we'll, we'll all get along. And he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. I mean, that's an this is such an amazing event. We, we're, we get so just used to hearing about it, but he, when it says he wrote them on tables, it's talking about the fact that God wrote them. It was written with the very finger of God. That God wrote on these stones, these Ten Commandments, and gave them to Moses to take down and give to them. It's an amazing story. But, you know, before we, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of closing out the Ten Commandments here. We're getting to the end of the chapter. But what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? Like, what, what is it about the Ten Commandments that we should understand? Well, one, you know, the, the, the Jesus said the whole of the law, you know, is, 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 it can be summed up in this one thing. That, uh, uh, 
um, love thy neighbor as thyself. And you can see that in these commandments. You know, if you love your neighbor, you're, you know, you're, not, gonna, you're not going to kill him. You know, you're not going to uh, commit adultery with their spouse. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to bear false witness against them. You're not going to covet their things and steal, right? That's how you could say, well, if you love your neighbor as yourself, because you don't want anyone doing those things to you, right? right? So that's, a, you know, those commandments, they show us that this is a good way for society to operate. And if we could just get those things down, and isn't that what society struggles with the most? Yeah. And so well, these are so simple. This is such a basic, you know, chapter. These Ten Commandments, only ten? Yeah, but these are the things that society gets wrong the most. Look at all the theft and the murder and the adultery and the coveting that's going on in the world. You know, and this is, so, you know, if we worked on these things, we'd be off. We'd be a lot better off as people. But what the law also does here is it shows us our sinfulness. Because, again, this is the things that we struggle with the most. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're almost done here. When you get to 2 Corinthians 3, keep something there. It's interesting what Paul calls uh, the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth. Right? He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the law. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth light. Verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious. So what was written and engraven in stones? The Ten Commandments. The law. Right? That's what was written and engraven in stone. Right? But what does he call it here in verse 7? The ministration of death. That's what the Ten Commandments are. It's the ministration of death. Because what the Ten Commandments do is show you, you've broken these. You can't keep these. Well, I've never committed adultery. Jesus said, if thou look upon a woman to lust, thou hast committed adultery already in her heart. Well, I've never killed anybody. If thou hast hated thy brother, and if you hate your brother, you've committed uh, murder in your heart already. So it, the, the law, the Ten Commandments, deal with the heart of man. And it shows us that whether or not we do these things, <coughs> we struggle with them inwardly. And it's called the ministration of death because we have broken these, these, these commandments. Either in our hearts or actually having done them. <coughs> and he goes on, uh, go ahead and turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I'll read to you from Romans 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. And again, didn't... <laughs> He just said, thou shalt not covet. That's one commandment. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, rotten manner of me, all, all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Can you see why Paul called it the ministration of death? Because the law slew him. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. But was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The, com the commandments, the, the ministration of death, it's the ministration of death because it shows us how sinful we are. And the soul that sinneth shall die. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily the righteousness which had been by the law. You know, if you could keep all the commandments and never break them, you could go to heaven because you wouldn't have any sin, right? I mean, if you could keep all these things perfect, like the, good, like the rich young ruler said to Jesus, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? You know, if you could do that, which wasn't true, by the way, the guy's a liar, if you could do all those things, you could live. You could live in those things and you could go to heaven. But here's the thing, we've all broken these things because we all have a sin nature. We all have you know, sin within us. <clears throat> and the law brings that out. It shows us our sinful condition. <clears throat> Look at verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That was the purpose of the law. To show you you're a sinner and that you need Christ. It was to teach you that you cannot get to heaven based on your own good works. 
because you, you're already condemned by the law. And it's amazing how many people say when we knock on their door, how do you go to heaven? By being a good person. But the Bible says there are none good. No, not one. No. Oh, but you will keep the commandments, but we haven't kept them. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. But people, they say that all the time. Well, I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to live a good life. I'm going to be a good person. But that's not what the commandments are there for. They're there to show you you're not a good person in the eyes of God. Now, humanly speaking, we say, hey, that guy's a good guy. right? We understand that. But the Bible's showing us that the, that the purpose of the law was to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, to show us a need for a Savior, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So you don't go to heaven by keeping law. You go to heaven through Christ. And that's why it says we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Once we've come to this knowledge, you know, we don't, the law isn't there to... Uh, we understand that we're condemned, we're saved. We've, we've learned the lesson, so to speak, from the schoolmaster. <clears throat> but let's just close up here in uh, verse 23 of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. And it came to pass when you heard the voice, verse 23, out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. So he's going to begin describing what their reaction was when they saw this. What was the reaction of the people? You know, was it like, ooh, ah, you know, and they saw the fire and everything coming down. Like they're looking at fireworks, you know, like they're, they're trying to synchronize it with some kind of, you know, operatic piece of music or something. No, what was their, what was their reaction? And he said, verse 24, Behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. And we have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. And they were overwhelmed by this. They were afraid. For who is there of all flesh that heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have and lived? Go thou near, and hear all the, uh, that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee and we will hear it and do it. He said, you know what? We don't want to hear from him anymore, Moses. You go talk to him and tell us what he had to say. We can't take this anymore. This is too intense. And this wasn't like prolonged. God came down the pillar of fire, all the, the thick blackness, the darkness, the clouds, the lightnings, the thunderings, the quakings, all that. And he said, no more. He, this is all he said. And that was enough for them to say, we can't take this. This wasn't, you know, a, a, a four hour you know, lecture. And this was God just coming down and speaking the law to them. And that was enough for them to say, we, we're going to die. Moses, you, you tell them, you just, just make them stop. <clears throat> he said, uh, verse 27, Go thou near, and hear all the Lord shall say, and speak thou unto us, all the Lord shall speak unto thee, and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard your voice of your word. So he's saying, look, and God heard. So he's saying, the God heard what you said to me when you said that. You know, when you told me to go to God and, and, and I would tell you what he said, God heard you say that. He heard you what you said in verse 27. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the words of the voice of this people which they have spoken unto thee. And every time I read this, it just sends shivers up my spine. They have well said all that they have spoken. God said, you know what? You're right to be afraid. You're right to, to, to want Moses to come talk to me. You're right to think that this is too much for you to take. That you'll be consumed. <laughs> That's what he said. They have well spoken in all that they have said. Oh, that there was such a heart in them. And God, not only that, not only does he approve of that, he wishes it would continue, this fear that's in them. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Exclamation point there. God's very emphatic about this. I always found that interesting, that God has said, hey, I mean, you, know, you know, I'm not that bad of a guy. You know, it's not, hey, it's not like that, you know. I'm sorry if I came off a little too harsh with the whole pillar of fire thing. You know, I know I understand it's a little overwhelming for you, but you know, I'm I'm really gentle and, and, and God is all those things, but you know, this is the other side of God. The consuming fire, you know, the holy, righteous God. And the, and he says, you know what, you're right to be afraid. Go, verse 30, go to them. Uh, go say to them, get you uh, into your tents again. But as for thee, stand thou here by me. And I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which thou shalt teach them, 
that they may do them in the land which I shall give them to possess it. So God had more to say than the Ten Commandments. But now he's going to say, well, I'll tell you what. The rest of it, I'll tell to Moses and he can reiterate to you. You shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside the right hand or the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you that you may live. Again, I, I brought this up before. I know, but I'm going to bring this up again. Why does God have these rules? That ye may live and that you may be well with you. Not so, that God's not just trying to stroke his own ego with these rules. God's trying to protect mankind because he knows man is sinful. He's already seen the earth filled with violence once, and he doesn't want it to happen again. So he lays down the law. That it may be well with you, and they may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Again, all these commandments are given to us for our own good. You know, and they're, they're, they're not grievous. You know, they're good for us. And, uh, you know, <coughs> it just shows us you know, that God has his, our best interests in mind. You know, and if we ever get an attitude about, you know, having to keep these commandments or, you know, I just want to kill. You know, why not? <laughs> well, you know, whosoever shall live by the sword shall die by the sword. God's looking out for you. You know, God doesn't want, and he's looking out for others, you know. So that's going to be our sermon. Let's go ahead and pray.